Okay, so solubility okay, is an important physical property. Everything's ability to dissolve in water is slightly different, okay? Uh, and that has to do with, again, the nature of the particles, the nature of the arrangement of the particles, the types of bonds that, the, you know, particles might have with each other, whether it's molecular, ionic, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so what we just need to, to learn here is some general terminology, that's vocabulary, related to uh, solubility. And then we have to look at kind of things that might affect solubility. And understand that because water is a polar molecule, okay, and we'll talk about what a polar molecule is, um, it has a lot of behaviors that are very important, but also very strange. Okay. All right. Um, let's say I am making like some sort of drink where I have to mix powder in with water, okay, like, you know, like orange tang or something like that. Okay. Uh, so I'm making this drink. Now, I want to get as much of the drink mix to dissolve as possible. Okay, like when I make Kool-Aid, it like I know it's good if there's a layer of slightly undissolved sugar on the bottom of the pitcher. Okay, because that means I've put as much sugar as possible in there, and some of it wouldn't even dissolve. Okay, then it's good. Uh, so, what are some ways that I might be able to get more of that stuff to dissolve? What are some things I could do? Okay, I could heat it up. Okay, temperature affects solubility. The faster the particles of a material are moving, the more stuff will dissolve in them. Okay, what else? Shake it or stir it. Agitation increases the rate at which the particles move and allows more things to dissolve. Now, as soon as that agitation stops, however, they are going to slowly come back out of solution. All right, so those are two of kind of the biggest ways. Sometimes you can also add um, other materials to the mixture that can help to increase the solubility. For example, soap. Okay, soap helps to increase the solubility of many things uh, in water, which is why we use it. Okay, you know, to clean dishes, it cuts grease, it makes it more soluble in water than it would be if it was just water. Okay, things like that. So there's things that we can do that can make things more soluble. Okay, so like we said, some things are going to dissolve easily and some don't. Right? If you ever tried to dissolve butter in water, it just doesn't work. Okay, they're not soluble in each other. Okay. Um, same if you get like oil-based stain or paint on your hands. If you're ever been, like staining a deck or a fence or something like that, the type of paint we typically use for that is oil-based because it's outside and we want it to repel water. But you get it on your hands, you can't wash it off with soap and water because it's designed specifically to keep water out. So what do you have to use instead? No one's ever gotten like paint on their hands and had to use paint thinner or turpentine, Varsol? Even gasoline will take it off. What's that? Oh, just use your willpower. Okay, sandpaper and water. Yeah, okay. What's that? Baking soda and water a little bit, but again, just that's more for the um, abrasiveness than it is a chemical thing, okay? If we use paint thinner, so Varsol or turpentine or things like that, okay, it'll actually dissolve the paint because it's not like water, it's a, it's a non-polar chemical. And so it is soluble or allows things that are also like it to dissolve. Right? Everybody kind of follow me there? Like if you put gasoline in water, it separates. Okay? But if you put um, you know, gasoline and some other nonpolar thing together, they'll dissolve in each other. Okay? Okay, so if things are alike, okay, then they will, they will dissolve in each other. Okay, so solubility is the degree to which something will dissolve in something else. Most of the time, solubility is measured as the ability to dissolve in water at room temperature. Okay, that's the most common uh, kind of definition of solubility. Now, a substance is said to be insoluble if it will not dissolve, okay? Which is weird because in the English language, we have this problem with the prefix in. Insoluble means it won't dissolve. Inflammable means it will. Dumb, okay? Really confusing. They should really fix that. Okay, from a safety perspective, that's really bad. Okay, um, so insoluble means it will not dissolve in another substance. Okay, if a substance remains insoluble and in a solid form, okay, we call it a precipitate. Right now, most of the time, a precipitate forms in a reaction. So I mix two things that are clear, okay, and I get something that's not soluble as a product of the reaction. Then it looks like this powder falls out 
of the solution, kind of like snow falls out of the sky, that hence the name precipitate. Okay? It actually falls out of the solution. Okay, so what you can see here in this second picture is that a precipitate has formed, it's this cloudy material, and it will slowly descend okay, to the bottom of that container. All right. Now, um, different names for different kinds of uh, mixtures. Okay, this mixture here, how many parts can I see? Just one. Okay, this has one visible part. It is two things, but it is one visible part. That is why this is called a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. Okay, because the prefix homo means one. Okay. So that's, that's where we get that term from. That's why when you buy milk, it says it's homogenized. Same with, uh, with peanut butter, it's homogenized. That means it keeps itself all in one part. If you get like real organic uh, peanut butter, it separates. Oil, the peanut oils will sit on top and the rest of the stuff will go on the bottom. And each time you want to use it, you have to stir it. All right, because it's not homogenized. To homogenize it, they have to heat it up. Okay, and uh, there's a chemical process involved as well that will keep it all as one part instead of allowing it to separate. Okay, um, milk when it first comes out of the cow. Okay, if you leave it sitting, it'll separate. Cream rises to the top. Okay, everything else will settle to the bottom. It's not homogenized. There's a heat-based chemical process that happens in order to keep milk in one homogenized state. Okay, so everyone get the idea of what the term homogeneous means, okay, so homogeneous means one visible part, okay, so a solution, okay, then is any mixture containing solute, okay, and uh, it's completely dissolved, that is a homogeneous mixture, okay, if I have the second one, so the one here on the right, okay, this has obviously two visible parts, whatever this stuff is, it's not soluble, right, now, if I stir it, I might be able to suspend it, but I'm not going to be able to dissolve it, okay? In that way, we call that a mechanical mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. It is not a solution, okay? It's just a mixture, okay? One thing is not dissolved in the other, okay? I could separate these by a mechanical means. That means I could filter this, okay? If I had a paper filter, like a coffee filter, okay, I could just pour the liquid through and the coffee filter would catch the stuff that's not dissolved. Would I be able to do that with this? No, I could only separate this by a physical means. That means if I boiled it off, whatever was dissolved in it would stay behind and the water would boil away, okay? I would use the physical properties of one of the two parts in order to separate them. In this case, I can mechanically separate them. Okay. If I have a mixture of iron filings and sand, that's not a solution. Okay. I can suspend them, I can stir it up and, and mix them together, but they're not dissolved in one another, and I can separate them by a mechanical means. I just stick a magnet in there, stir it around, and I'll pull the magnet out with all the iron filings on it. Okay. There's always a mechanical way to separate a heterogeneous mixture, Okay, and the prefix hetero means multiple or many. Okay, so this is a heterogeneous mixture or a mechanical mixture. Okay, so are those terms going to be important? Those are the terms I would use on a quiz or a test, so you need to know what they mean so you're not confused. Okay, and more often than not, I will use these terms. Okay, heterogeneous and homogeneous okay, are likely to be the terms I will use. All right, solute. So a solute is the thing getting dissolved, all right? So if I'm, you know, putting sugar in coffee, okay, sugar is the solute, okay? The coffee or the water would be the solvent, okay? That's the thing doing the dissolving, okay? Um, so if I have salt and water, okay, salt would be the solute and water would be the solvent. Everyone all right with that? Okay. Solvent is the thing doing the dissolving. That's why we typically call things like, you know, Mr. Clean or, you know, whatever like that. Okay, we call them solvents. They help water to dissolve other things. Okay, they make things more soluble, like, um, you know, using CLR on, on uh, you know, the soap scum and hard water scales on the inside of your shower. Water doesn't dissolve that on its own. Okay, but if you put a solvent on there, okay, add it to the water, you make it more soluble. Okay, and you take it off. Okay, so make sure you know those terms, solute, okay, substance being dissolved, 
Okay, solvent. Okay, any substance that will dissolve another substance. Okay, those are definitely terms we need to know. Okay, now I'm going to show you a video here of uh, precipitate being formed. Okay, just so you can see what that looks like. So uh, precipitate then is any solid that's produced in a reaction and will not dissolve in solution. Okay, that's a term we're going to use a lot because uh, when we get into chemical reactions, okay, a lot of chemical reactions are going to produce those. Um, in fact, when we do our reactions lab next week sometime, we'll have two reactions that will produce very obvious um, precipitates. Okay, and then solubility. The degree to which a substance will dissolve in another substance is the pure definition of solubility. Okay, so how much solute can go into solution before the solvent becomes saturated? Okay, if something is saturated, it can't hold any more. All right, so if you go out in a rainstorm, okay, you can get saturated. Your clothes get so wet that they simply can't hold any more water and you're just dripping. Okay, uh, then you, you know, you're saturated. Similarly, okay, when I make Kool-Aid, I make a saturated solution. I add sugar until no more will dissolve and there's a layer of it on the bottom because then I know it's going to taste good. Okay, it's not good for me, but it'll taste good. Okay, all right. Now, some things are soluble, some things are not. Some things should be, some things shouldn't be. Okay, Twinkies are an example of this. The modern Twinkie is soluble in water. That's it right there. You put a modern Twinkie in water and it will dissolve in water. A Twinkie is supposed to be pastry. It's supposed to be cake with this filling inside that's, you know, not supposed to be soluble in water. It's supposed to get like mushy if you put it in water, but it shouldn't like dissolve. Okay. The, the reason that it now dissolves, unlike the original Twinkie, is because the original Twinkie was cake. Okay? It was made with eggs and flour and sugar and milk. Okay? And the filling was made with butter and sugar and that kind of stuff. It was made with natural ingredients. Okay? Many of those ingredients are molecular, and as a result, it did not dissolve in water. Okay? The problem with those ingredients is they're natural ingredients and they, well, it's not so much that they're expensive, but they'll rot, okay? You put a Twinkie on a shelf made of natural ingredients and its shelf life is considerably shorter than the modern Twinkie, which is made of much different things, okay? The shelf life of a modern Twinkie is a lot longer than you would probably care to think about, okay? Some of those Twinkies could be on the shelf for a very long time, okay? Like, you know, if you watch The Walking Dead, they could eat the Twinkies still, okay? from you know, before the fall of everything. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is, well, we now use artificial ingredients in the, in the Twinkie okay, because they're going to last longer, which increases your profit margin. Okay. You don't have to make as many, or you don't have to worry about as much of your merchandise going bad before it's purchased and eaten. So in the modern Twinkie, okay, or sorry, in the original Twinkie, what did the yellow color come from? Eggs. The yellow color came from eggs, but eggs go bad, so we replaced it. Okay, we have this kind of protein mixture that they use as a substitute for eggs, kind of like powdered eggs, except it's not yellow. Um, and so, as a result, when you use that, the Twinkie is gray and looks like it's made out of wallpaper paste. Okay, yeah, it's pretty gross. So, to get the original yellow color back, what do they put in? Yes, specifically yellow dye number five, which is a known carcinogen and is actually banned by the Food and Drug Administrations of most European countries, but not in North America. It's heaven forbid hostess wouldn't be able to sell Twinkies. Okay? So this stuff is really bad for you, but it's what they use to make Twinkies look like they still have eggs in them. Okay? Instead of using milk, they use milk substitutes, which are artificial ingredients. Okay? They add preservatives because they still have to put sugar in there. Okay? There's nothing, you know, they don't want to use an artificial sweetener. Okay. Why, why? I don't know, but they don't want to. Okay. So they have sugar in there. Sugar is what feeds mold and bacteria. So they put in preservatives, one of which is used in embalming fluid. 
Everyone knows what embalming fluid is, right? It's the stuff they actually like put into dead bodies so that they don't stink before the funeral. I know that's really callous, but that's what that's what embalming fluid is. They're one of the ingredients, one of the preservatives is an ingredient of it's not it not it, it isn't embalming fluid. It's one of the ingredients in embalming fluid is it helps to keep bacteria and stuff from growing on the Twinkie before it gets purchased and eaten. Well, yeah, it was a waste of a Twinkie, but it's a, it's important to show that these artificial ingredients are actually soluble in water versus the natural ingredients. So you put a piece of cake that you actually make from scratch in water and it'll get soggy and it'll swell up and it'll just kind of, you know, fill up the glass, but it won't dissolve. Okay. This Twinkie is, is literally dissolved. Okay. In the water and like you could just pour it out. Right. If you had the piece of cake in there, it would be like, it would be stuck in there, It'd be like a sponge. Okay, this stuff literally dissolves okay, in the water. So, well, I'm not saying don't buy a Twinkie. I'm saying everything in moderation. Okay, like I mean, if you're eating ten Twinkies a day, well, that's a lot of Twinkies in a day, and it's not really. It's got some ingredients that aren't good for you. Everything in moderation, guys. Like if you're always drinking, you know, if you're drinking two liters of pop a day, that's not good for you. But if you don't have a can here or there, that's that's not so bad. It's not going to kill you. Okay? Everything in moderation. Okay, making sense there. Okay. Now, on the back of your periodic table, you will find a chart that looks like this one. Oh, why is that so far away? All right, so it's on the back here. It says solubility of some common ionic compounds in water at 298.15 Kelvin. That's room temperature, by the way. Okay, um, so what we have here are uh, is, is a chart that allows us to figure out whether or not something is soluble in water. Okay, it only works for ionic compounds because obviously most molecular compounds aren't soluble. Okay, but okay, what this allows us to do to, to determine is is this compound soluble or not? All right. So if I have let's say um, lithium chloride, and I want to determine whether that's soluble or not. Okay. What I do is I find the non-metal in this top row. Okay. The non-metal in lithium chloride is chlorine. Okay. So there's where chlorine is. Now, it says in the, according to this chart that most things are very soluble with chlorine. Okay. The exceptions would be these. All right. And we're kind of following how this chart works. Okay, so would lithium chloride be soluble or not? Yes, it's not listed here under the things that are not, so it must be part of most. Okay, so lithium chloride would be soluble. All right, if I had instead, let's say, um, silver sulfate, let's say. All right, would that be soluble or not? All right, so I find sulfate, says it's soluble with most things, which is not really helpful because then I have to go down here and find out what things are not part of most, okay? Calcium, strontium, barium, mercury, lead, silver. All right, so silver sulfate is essentially not. It says slightly here, but slightly essentially means not. It's going to make a precipitate. Some of it might dissolve, but most of it is going to form a precipitate and fall out of solution. All right, everyone kind of follow how that chart works. That's going to be something else you're going to have to use in your uh, reactions lab. It's also something that'll come up on quizzes and tests. Is this soluble or is that soluble? Okay. So what I want you to do right now is tell me these eight, soluble or not soluble beside them. Okay, so write them down and write S or NS Beside them, sorry, I'm make sure I got all those in here. I think I do. Yeah, okay, so you can use your chart there and determine, I'll give you a couple minutes on that one. All right, so according to your guys' chart here, hey, uh, we got uh, lithium and fluorine together. So we look up fluorine, says it's soluble with most things, but the first thing listed in the not so soluble row is lithium. So this would be not soluble. All right, we got sodium sulfate. Okay, sulfate says it's soluble with most things and sodium is not listed among the things that are in the row below. So that one would be soluble. Okay, uh, ammonium nitrates. Okay, um, so we actually have two 
group one ions there, we have ammonium and we have nitrate uh, on there, okay? Uh, they are soluble together, okay? This, they were, they're listed there in the first uh, column, okay? Uh, so that one is definitely soluble. In fact, basically all nitrate containing compounds are soluble except for these like four incredibly rare complex ions that they have listed there. Okay. Then we have silver chloride. So we look at the chlorine column. Silver is listed in the second row. That would be not soluble. Okay, we have uh, lead two or lead uh, two iodide here. Okay, and so when we look up iodine, we find it's soluble with most things, but lead two plus is listed down in the other row. Okay, in fact, this stuff is a bright yellow precipitate. Okay, like very very bright yellow. Uh, then we got number six. Okay, we got H2S. All right, and oh, you know what? You guys can't do that one because they changed this. Sulfur is not on there anymore. But this is a strong acid, which is soluble. Okay, um, so in general, if you have something that is a strong acid containing hydrogen, it's soluble in water. Okay. Um, all right, number seven. Okay, we have K3PO4, so potassium phosphate. Okay, we look up phosphate. It says it's soluble with group one ions. Here's what you need to know about group one ions. Okay, the periodic table is set up in columns. Each column is a group. Group one is the first column. Is potassium in that group? Yes. So this stuff is soluble. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it says, yeah, group one ions, again, soluble with themselves, right, essentially. Okay, uh, and then for number eight, we have mercury uh, with chlorine. That's the mercury with the two plus charge. Okay, so we find chlorine's column, soluble with most things, but mercury with the two plus charge is listed in the second not so soluble row. Okay, so that's what we should have there. All right, nothing too difficult, but certainly a skill you'll be expected to be able to demonstrate to me on a quiz or a test or a lab, okay, like next week on your reactions lab. Okay, questions on that? All right. Okay, um, now, when we talked about molecular compounds, okay, we talked about how they have this covalent bond where the electrons are shared, and it's incredibly strong. They don't want to break up, okay? They're depending on each other to have this full outer shell of electrons, okay? That made them very different from ionic compounds, which traded electrons and broke up easily. Water is that type of molecule, okay? It has a bond where the electrons are shared. However, it's not as nice as it seems, okay? Everything sounds nice when you say, oh, they share the electrons because sharing usually implies that the sharing is equal. Water is not that way, okay? Water is what we call a polar molecule. And as such, the electrons are not equally shared, which means they spend more time at one end of the molecule than they do at the other, causing it to become polarized. That is, one end will become positive and the other end will become negative, okay? Because the electrons spend more time around one of them than they do around the others, okay? All right, so we just need to remember, okay, that electrons are shared, okay? So in, uh, in a covalent bond, okay, electrons get shared, but the sharing isn't necessarily very equal. Okay, so the sharing's not equal. Some elements are more electronegative than others. So again, with your periodic table here, if you look at the little key box here, okay, it contains, uh, iron is the key box, okay, uh, it says atomic number is 26, and then right below that is 1.8, okay, that number there is the electronegativity, that number tells us how hard or how strongly that element holds on to electrons, so for most metals, that number is fairly low, Okay, but for a lot of nonmetals, that number can be quite a bit higher. For example, okay, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.4, which is quite high, okay, compared to hydrogen, whose electronegativity is 2.2, which is quite low. All right, so because um, oxygen has a high electronegativity, electrons tend to hang out around it more often than they would around hydrogen. So what we end up with is electrons being up here and not here. So essentially what you have is kind of like Mickey Mouse and his two ears are the protons that make up the, nu the nucleus of the hydrogen atoms and they kind of stick out. 
Okay? These bare protons just stick out from the top of this molecule and show their positive charge. Okay? The electrons, meanwhile, are not orbiting that nucleus anymore. They're spending a lot more time down around oxygen, causing oxygen to become more negative. And so what you end up with is every water molecule has two positive poles and two negative poles. All right, so we can see here, here's one hydrogen atom and it's positive. Here's a hydrogen atom, it's positive. And then there'd be these two negative regions where essentially their two electrons, those two hydrogen atoms electrons are hanging out, okay? And they're causing the bottom of that molecule to appear negative, okay? So that's what we mean by a polar molecule, okay? In a polar molecule, okay? Electrons are not shared equally. Okay. That doesn't mean that water wants to break up. It doesn't mean that it wants to, you know, separate or anything like that. It doesn't mean that it's ionic. It just means that the electrons are all there. They're just not being shared equally. Now, if you have a molecule like water that's got two positive poles and two negative poles, what do positives and negatives do to each other? Uh, no, they don't repel. They do the opposite. If I have a positive and a negative, they're going to attract each other. And so that's what happens with water molecules is, okay, the positive pole or a hydrogen atom on one water, water molecule is going to be attracted to the negative pole on another water molecule. And they can form what's called a hydrogen bond. Okay, hydrogen bonds are fairly weak, okay, but they break and reform very easily because they're based on something that's not changing. These opposite charges and the attraction between them. Okay? So water molecules will create these hydrogen bonds between each other, which is what causes surface tension. Okay? So if you've ever you know, seen you know, how you can fill, you fill up a glass, but you can fill it slightly more than full, almost looks like there's a film over the top of the water. That's because of the hydrogen bonding going on between all of the little tiny water molecules that are present there. Now, can you break that pretty easy? Just put your finger on it, right? And it's gone. Okay, you break it up, but it'll reform. Surface tension comes back. All right, it's the same thing that allows you to skip a rock across a lake. Okay, there's surface tension there. Okay, if you throw the rock at a nice low angle, it'll bounce off of that surface tension. If you throw it at an angle that's almost straight down, then it goes right through. Okay, breaks the surface tension. Um, if you've ever seen like bugs, some bugs, okay, will float on the surface of the water. Okay? It's not so much that they're floating, they're actually riding the surface tension. Okay? If you like throw a rock near them, they'll sink because you'll break the surface tension that they were riding on okay? and down they'll go. Right? All of these things are ways that, um, there are things that show us that there are these hydrogen bonds going on. Okay? Now that's hydrogen bonds between water molecules. Hydrogen bonds can form between water molecules and other molecules as well. Okay. If you've ever had a really cold drink, okay, you know that condensation can form on the outside of the glass, but it doesn't run down right away. It seems to stick, okay, and it seems to defy gravity and hold itself there. And that's because the water molecules have formed hydrogen bonds with the glass. Okay, and until that thing gets big enough that those hydrogen bonds aren't strong enough to hold it there, it'll sit there. Okay? Eventually it'll get big enough or you'll jerk the glass or something like that, and then the, the water droplet will run down the side because the hydrogen bonds were broken. Okay? They'll reform fairly quickly, but you can break them easily as well. Okay? Is that making some sense? Okay? So that's one of the things that water uh, causes water to do that. Now, if I put ice in a drink, where does it go? Sink to the bottom or float to the top? floats to the top. That is not the case with basically anything else. Okay? Most things in their solid form are more dense than in their liquid form because as, as you cool something, it contracts and the, the molecules, the particles, whatever, get closer together, not with water. Okay? Because water is charged, well, not charged, but has these charged ends, there's a limit to how close together you can force them. Okay? And it's actually, well, it's a liquid. Okay? Um, water is most dense at about four degrees Celsius, okay, above freezing. When you get water to about four degrees Celsius, the water molecules get so close together that now the positives are close enough to the positives that there will be an instant of repulsion, okay, and it will expand outwards and then freeze, okay. And so 
ice is less dense than water because the particles are actually further apart than they are when it's a liquid, okay? which is why ice will float on top. Okay? Pretty important when you think about how things survive in water over the winter here. Okay? If ice was more dense than water, lakes would freeze from the bottom, which means it would freeze solid all the way to the bottom every year. No fish would survive. No other aquatic organisms would survive the winter. Okay? Because ice floats on the top, it freezes on the top first and actually insulates the water below, creates pressure that doesn't allow it to freeze all the way to the bottom. Okay? So all of these are things that are the result of water being a polar molecule. Okay, So we got water here, like we said, it can bond to four other molecules because of those four poles that it has. Okay, A positive pole here on a hydrogen, a positive pole here, a negative pole, and actually another negative pole over there. Okay, It allows water to bond okay, with other molecules there. Okay, So this is what I was talking about before here, this diagram. When water is in a liquid state at about 4 degrees, the water molecules are very close together. Okay, But as we try and get it to get closer than that, okay, they actually repel and they form a crystalline shape, okay, ice, and that is going to be less dense than the liquid, and so it will float on the top. Okay, This is a diagram here of water forming a hydrogen bond with another polar molecule. Okay, So hydrogen bonds can form with other polar molecules. It doesn't have to always be water, more often than not it is, okay, but um, it can form with other um, non-polar, or sorry, with other polar molecules. Okay. All right, so hydrogen bonds are important, okay, knowing what that is, okay, so this these anomalous properties of water, surface tension, and things like that are because of these hydrogen bonds. This is how trees and basically all vascular plants are able to transport water from their roots to their leaves. Okay? A plant requires no energy to transport water from its roots to its leaves. It's an entirely passive process. There's no pump inside the tree that's squeezing the water up to the, up to the leaves. Okay? It's entirely passive. The two forces involved are osmosis. So when water evaporates from the leaves, salt gets left behind water moves towards the salt. Okay, As the water moves towards the salt, because water is polar, it's bonded to every single water molecule all the way down the tree. Like uh, if you ever played with like a barrel of monkeys when you were a kid, you know how you hook the arms together and you can lift them all up? It's like that. Okay, Inside the tree at a molecular level, they're linked. They're bonded by these hydrogen bonds. Okay, And so as a result, as water moves towards the salt, it pulls all the other water up the tree along with it. Okay? Now, the key to that working though is that the tubes that transport water are really small or really big? Really small. Because if they're really big, the weight of the water would be too heavy for these weak hydrogen bonds to hold it. Okay? So inside of a tree, millions and millions of microscopic tubes. Okay? And this process is going, in, going on inside of those microscopic tubes, allowing the water to move up the tree. Okay? Which is why if you spill certain things next to a tree, it can die. Okay? Because it can it can ruin that solubility, that a polar nature of water, and not allow those hydrogen bonds to form, and then the tree can't transport water anymore, okay? and it essentially just dries up. All right, so uh, things to think about there. Okay, um, this th this term here is going to be important. Okay, so bonds break easily, they reform easily. Okay, hydrogen bonds hold the substances together. Okay, in cohesion, cohesion is due to hydrogen bonding. Okay. Uh, between water molecules. Okay, so if it's cohesion, it's things that are alike sticking together. Okay. If water hydrogen bonds to something else, so not water, the inside of the trunk of a tree, for example, which is what happens, okay, then it's called adhesion. All right, so you can see right here in this part of the picture. We have two water molecules that are bonded together, so these two here, okay? That hydrogen bond is cohesion because they're both water molecules. But there's also a hydrogen bond going on right here between the negative part of this water molecule and the inside of the tree, okay? That process, while still hydrogen bonding, 
is called adhesion because we're sticking two things that are not alike together. Okay, so like an adhesive sticks two things not alike together. Okay, so we add here or we cohere. Okay. All right. All right, so adhesion, okay, like we said, okay, is the clinging of a substance to another. Okay, that's again also hydrogen bonding. So that would be these droplets of water stuck to the leaf. Okay, they're they're adhering to that. Okay, um, you can even apparently do this. I'm not sure exactly how they did that because I tried it one afternoon and I couldn't make it happen. But okay, apparently the surface tension on a glass of water is strong enough you can suspend a paper clip. I think the key is you have to bend the pointy ends up, otherwise they break the surface tension. Okay, uh, and I think you have to lower it on there with another clip or, or with like a pair of tweezers. Because if you try to lower it on with your fingers, your fingers always break the surface tension. So you have to be like super careful. I couldn't make it work, but somebody did it. Okay, and it looks cool. Right. Um, so you can, you know, you've probably all seen this here, like water droplets, like dew in the morning on grass or leaves or things like that. Okay. That it, until you come along and bump the leaf, it's going to sit there. It's hydrogen bonded to the leaf. All right. Are there any animals that might use hydrogen bonding and that surface tension? And we talked about bugs already, like, you know, water striders and, you know, mayflies and things like that. Okay. But there's some that are a little bigger, like this guy. Okay, the Jesus lizard, okay, they can run across the surface of the water. Okay, as long as they move fast enough, okay, they can actually, you know, not disrupt the surface tension too much and actually get traction and push off of the water, right? Uh, but they have to go really fast. If they slow down, they'll fall in, okay, because they, they're too much of their weight is on there. Instead of pushing sideways, they're falling down, right? But they can, they can also do that. Okay, questions on that? All right. That is what you need to know about solubility. So I will grab the Chromebooks because I had them booked here and you got about another 15 minutes or so where you can uh, work with your group. Um, what I would suggest, one of the things you need to do in this 15 minutes is make yourself an observations chart, like the one that's in your lab report that you can take into the lab tomorrow. So draw it out on a sheet of loose leaf, okay? That you can take into the lab because obviously you won't be taking the Chromebooks into the lab tomorrow. Okay.